particular about what tonight's going to be about. So the coffee break will be just moved up a little bit. Um, so let's move to our first talk. So who we got this afternoon? So our speaker is Ekin Osman. She will speak about twisting modular curves. Thank you for the introduction, and um, I would like to thank the organizers organizing this wonderful workshop. This is by far my most my, my favorite um, conference, um, and I mean women in numbers in general. And also thanks for the invitation to speak. Um, so I was told to prepare a general and less technical talk. So I don't know if I was able to succeed in that. I tried, but at least like hopefully the first slide is. Uh, <laughs> 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 along that direction. Um, so, of course, like, I mean, this is like a slide that is there. If, if in general, if someone which is not uh, doing math asks me what kind of problems I'm working on, this is how I try to describe my research to them. Um, and like, uh, I slide the line equation because everyone knows what lines are and everyone can solve a linear equation, even a kid, I can explain this. Um, and then this, of course, things change drastically, yes, like rapidly. Um, and the Fermat equation is also something um, I would like to give as an example because it's very popular. Of course, everyone knows about it, or most people know about it. And I, like, it's, 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 it's an importance in my personal history as well because the first time I've seen it, I was in my last year in elementary school. It was in the cover of my textbook. Um, and I saw it and I thought, wow, like, I can't, I can't believe this is not known. Like, then I was like, uh, I was convinced that there are problems in math that are open, that's still a very, very basic to state. But of course, the coursework was outdated. I mean, by the time I've seen this <coughs> statement, it was already solved. <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's okay, I mean, it got me excited. Um, so then, like, um, the objects of this talk, um, or um, this, this research, the research is, has something to do with the uh, equations that are closely related to the Fermat type equations, and I will refer to them as, like, twisted Fermat equations, even though, like, um, because of the time constraints, I won't be able to tell you exactly what the relationship um, of the main object of this talk with the twist Fermat equation, but you should just keep in mind that there is a relationship. Exactly similar to like the role that the elliptic curves play in the proof of Fermat's last theorem, there is a, a family of elliptic curves um, that are closely related to the elliptic curves over Q that play similar roles in solving twisted Fermat, equation, um, twisted Fermat equations. So, okay, that's the general uh, philosophy um, and like kind of the five minute, um, not technical at all, <laughs> part of my talk. And now I will just set up some notation. So, um, the main object of the talk is a, um, is, is, is a family of curves that are, uh, that are produced from uh, the classical modular curve. So, I'm just going to remind you what classical modular curves are and then set up the notation while doing that. So n will be a square-free positive integer, and by, by 0 n, we will denote the modulized space of tuples, um, E and phi, where E is an elliptic curve, and phi is a cyclic n isogeny of E. And then, this is a non-compact curve, so we compactify it by adding some uh, certain number of cusps, and these cusps, are, the important thing about these cusps are, these are the points defined over rationals. So they are rational points on this yeah, compactified curve x0 n. Another important um, thing about this modular curve, at, at least for us, for the purpose of this talk, um, is this automorphism, uh, the Atkinander emulsion, uh, which takes a tuple E phi and basically just dual isogeny and uh, sends this tuple to E prime phi dual. And since the uh, isogeny and its dual have the same degree, um, this is still a point on our curve. So this is what the Atkinner evolution does to the affine piece of our curve. And uh, what about the cusps, you might ask? It just permutes the cusps. So uh, the important thing we should keep in mind is that none of the cusps are <coughs> fixed by this evolution. They're all permuted. So um, you want, I mean, you, as soon as you have an algebraic curve, um, you might want to wonder about its rational points. But if you have a moduli space, you might be more curious about its rational points because um, those rational points give you information about the objects that are parameterized by, by this curve. So if you ask the question as like, what are the rational points of x0 n? Well, uh, you at least say that it's not empty for any n because the cusps are there. But of course, this is like, you know, much more than this thanks to the laser seven basic result. We know that cusps are the only rational points if n is big enough. So, um, 
thanks to this result, for instance, the fact that there are only um, this many of uh, torsion subgroups of E over Q, like like Wei mentioned in, in the morning, this is like a corollary of this of this result, in some sense. Okay, but what we will be um, working on will be a curve that is produced from this classical modular curve X0n, why it's twisting, and I just want to generally uh, define what, I, what do I mean by twisting. So you can twist any curve, any algebraic curve, and this just means another curve that's defined over the same field uh, that you started with. So the, the field of resolution of your original curve and the twisted curve are the same, but uh, your two curves are not necessarily isomorphic over this field of definition. However, they become isomorphic over a certain extension. So if you, sorry. Just about the previous slide, when you say fractional point of X not, does that mean uh, the exogeny is defined over Q as well? Or is yes. That so the, about, uh, I mean, the isogeny is defined over Q, so the kernel, uh, the cyclic angle, the cyclic group is a, as a group defined over Q, not pointwise. Okay, so each, okay, so anyway, the, those n torsion points you need, which are the kernel, are actually live over Q, is that there's an n torsion point defined over Q? No, not necessarily. The group itself. So it, think this group. The, the group is isomorphic to z mod n z, right? right? So if I hit the group by a Galois map, sigma in the absolute Galois group of Q, I still get back the same group, right. but the, the points might be shifted inside the group. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> it's, it's okay. Yeah. And zero is a constant. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, I mean, back to this. So like, if you mention this definition to a geometer, like, or to somebody who's working over an algebraic closed field, uh, the twist and the actual curve doesn't matter, like, they don't differ at all. They are the same curve, there's no question for them. Uh, but for us, of course, arithmetically, these two curves are quite different, so because the action of Gola is different, um, therefore there are things to be answered arithmetically. And the, the nice thing is that we can understand the twists uh, quite easily. They are classified by this uh, cohomology group. So as soon as you have, um, like, you know the automorphisms of your curve, you can uh, come up with a co-cycle and you can produce the twist that corresponds to this co-cycle and vice versa. So now I will tell you uh, what kind of co-cycle I'm interested in and the corresponding twist. Um, this is gonna be really basic uh, for the purpose of this talk, but you can do this in higher generality as well. Um, for this, we will just restrict ourselves to the quadratic um, twist. So our cocycle will be, like we define on the slide, it will take a, 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 a Galois map, uh, the, the generator of a quadratic extension of Q, uh, and it will send this Galois map to WM, to the Atkin energy motion. So other than that, it's not doing anything. So all the other Galois maps are Acting as usual, we're just changing the action of one single color map. So then um, you can see that uh, from like running this machinery of this correspondence between twists and the cycles, you can see that the rational points on the twisted modular curve are the k rational points on the classical modular curve that are fixed by the composition of this Galois conjugation and WM. So it may not be fixed. Um, necessarily by each of these maps separately, but the composition fix and fixes them. Okay? So the importance is that, I mean, this is just another algebraic curve, you might be curious about this rational points, but there is more to care about this rational points because this is also a modulized space, like x0 and itself, and the rational <laughs> points of this modulized space classify something that's called Q curves. These are like a, a closed relative of empty curves over Q. They are also empty curves, Q curves are empty curves, but not defined over Q. They are defined over a number of fields. However, they are isogenous to every Galois conjugate. So their um, their um, Galois class is like invariant under isogeny. Like the isogeny class is sorry, the isogeny class is invariant under the action of Galois. Yeah. And since we usually study elliptic curves up to isogeny anyway, um, this is a, like a, a, a natural generalization of the notion of an elliptic curve. And use, like, these are the guys, the Q curves are, the, um, are, are playing the role of elliptic curves um, when solving twisted Fermi equations. So you study the ramification or the modularity questions about Q curves in order to solve mixed um, exponent Fermi equations. Okay, so the same question, um, what are the rational points of the twisted curve? Well, the, the uh, answer is that 
it's not immediate because now the cusps are not rational. So if you recall, cusps are points that I have coordinates defined over rationals, so they are not changed by tau. However, Wn is permitting them, so they are changed by Wn. Therefore, they are not uh, fixed by the composition. So there are no immediate, there are no natural rational points on these twisted curves. So there's a question um, to be answered. However, um, as we all know, I mean, asking about the existence of global points or the study of global points on, on varieties or in, on curves is a hard question. So the first thing, the, the, the first naive thing you would ask is that what are local points? Yeah, sorry. So what's a quadratic Q curve of degree n? Oh, I, sorry, I didn't say that. You said thanks for asking that. It means that my, my electric curve is defined over a quadratic number field. Okay. And uh, there's only one isogeny then, because there's only one global conjugate, and that's a degree n isogeny. Okay. Thanks for asking that, yeah. Yes? Can you just clarify what it means when that thing is a moduli space of some Q curves and also it's a moduli space for other curves, other sets of curves? I just don't understand why. Oh, yeah, sorry. So that this this particular space, so you have three ingredients here, right? You have, um, sorry, two ingredients. You have N and D. So this is the moduli space of quadratic Q curves of degree N that are defined over Q adjoined with D. Okay. okay? So like this is very specific in that sense, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thanks for all the clarifications. Yeah. Okay, so the first question is that like, if you fix N, D, and P, what can you tell about local points on this, uh, on this twisted modular curve? This was what I uh, studied in my, in my thesis. Um, and the cool thing is that um, most of the time, they are lacking the existence of local points. So right away, you will say that there are no global points. This was the case for at least uh, many of the examples that I was, many of the families that I was trying to study, for instance, like this is an immediate example that I can, I always like to give. Um, and the conditions, like, um, like, okay, I'll mention the conditions later on, but as soon as you can answer the first question, let's say you have sufficient necessary conditions for the local points, um, you would like to know what are, what about global points? So can you give uh, the number of curves, uh, or can you give a formula for the, the, the uh, members of this family that has local points everywhere but no global <coughs> points. And if you can do that, then maybe like you want to ask more particular questions like what about like if I, uh, instead of dealing with the whole family itself, if I pick a member of it, which I know doesn't have global points but has local points everywhere, what are the reasons of this as a principle violation? Can you explain that? So, these were like, like some fundamental questions. So what's the notion of P phi sub P? Oh, that's the Hilbert symbol, sorry. So you're looking whether or not five is a norm in Q of D. Yeah. And if you have a point which is which is a rational point, then what does that mean about the curve in the moduli space? What's it means rational? that you have a quadratic Q curve defined over Q of D of degree n. Okay, and if it's and if it's defined over a higher field in the then it's not. Space? So the thing is like yeah, it's a good so. Um, all the Q curves, there's a result of Elkis that says that all the Q curves are geometrically isogenous to Q curves defined over polyquadratic fields. So like, if, you're, if you can understand the building block of the quadratic case, uh, you can extend your results to the polyquadratics and you know everything about Q curves. Which, I mean, I, I, I mean, it's also doable, but I didn't write them here. This is the most basic case. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure that was my question though. Sorry, what was your question? Oh, I, well, I just mean, so you, you have this modular space uh -huh. and you have some points on it which are rational points. Yeah. And some which aren't. And the ones which aren't correspond to curves which are defined over some... Some number of field, yeah, but some, they're, yeah. But some extension they're K curve, if you want. field, or I, what, what are they else? Well, they are, so whatever field my they're... My question's big. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think, yeah, so whatever field they are defined over, um, they are admitting an isogeny to their Galois conjugate. But Galois conjugate, what do you mean by that? Like, I mean, because this is like, then, I, then probably you mean like if the curve is defined over L, let's say, L and join root D. Uh -huh, okay. uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh -huh, exactly, yeah. So then I would call it the K curve, for instance, yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. So the, the thing that I mean, this it's possible to give um, certain sufficient conditions for the first question um, for any NDP. And in fact, these conditions, uh, they are really explicit. It's so easy to check. You can even check them by hand. Um, so like this is just one of the conditions. I didn't want to write down all the conditions. That they the conditions depend on the relationship between N, D, and P. So there's a long list. 
but this is one of them, and so that just to illustrate that the conditions are easy to check. So given like given your given a curve or given these conditions, you can produce um, if an infant family which has local points everywhere. You can algorithmically do this, and then you might want to wonder uh, what about the global points in this family that you just produced, which has local points everywhere. And again, like it's it's an asymptotic result, but it's it's a, it's a, you can hear a formula for um, the number of curves that are violating the Hasse principle, and this is again an example. Um, for instance, like um, let's say your level is a prime, which is one mod four, and this bound for n there is just to make sure um, that I mean, in, in the method of the proof of this theorem, at some point you are taking the quotient of x zero n by w n. So if you want the genus of this quotient curve um, to be big enough, uh, then big enough uh, so that it will have finitely many points on that. So that, that bound for n is just to ensure that the quotient curve will have genus bigger or equal to 2. Um, and that's the number of curve, curves that are violating the Hasse principle in this family. OK, just, this is just a you know, general overview of like, what kind of questions you might ask um, if you have a family uh, of curves defined over q. But what I actually want to um, say now is that's kind of switching the gears. Um, when I was like, after I um, studied this question, I, of course, the natural thing was to understand the reasons of these violations. And I started to uh, pick examples and try to work on these examples. Um, and of course, as soon as you start working with curves and trying to find the obstructions, you see that you need different tools uh, uh, depending on the genus of your curve. I mean, if your curve has genus zero, there's no obstruction, so you're done. If your curve has genus uh, bigger than or equal to two, there, there's more than a way of sieve, usually works, or there are other methods that might be helpful. But if your curve is genus one, you are like in, like you're in a different situation. Like you can, you have, you, um, Depending how lucky you are, <laughs> either um, it's easy to show or it's extremely hard to show that or to understand the violations of uh, Hasse principle. So, but I, but I started to think about genus one curves, um, and I translated this question to uh, what, what does it mean? What are what do I mean when I say I'm twisting a genus one modular curve? Um, so this is really like simple, but I would like to go over it anyway. Um, so let's say the x zero n is an elliptic curve. And then the meaning of this Atkinian revolution, well, it's an automorphism of my curve, but it is not an automorphism as an elliptic curve automorphism, meaning that it is not fixing the identity. It's just an automorphism as a genus one curve. So that's what it does. Like this is how it looks like on my genus one curve. It's given a point x, you negate x and add a, a certain fixed point s, and s depends on the on your w n, so it changes. Um, of course. Um, so once we once we have this, we can explicitly write down the rational points on our twisted curve. These are k the, the, the points on the classical curve that are defined over q i j root t, such that when I hit the point uh, with tau, tau being the Gala conjugation, I get minus p plus s. Well, another way to write this down, if you move this minus p to the other side, you are asking for uh, whether or not tau p plus p is s. So you're asking whether or not your, your fixed point S is in the image of some trace map, right? Okay, so, um, well, you could, you could have done this locally as well. You could write down everything here for QP instead of Q. So the question to ask is that the existence of a point on the suicide curve is equivalent to S being in the, in the image of corresponding trace map. So the local global Hasse uh, principal violations can be translated to local to global trace obstructions for us. But if you look at it, like there is nothing in particular I use about x zero n being modular. I mean, this could have been you could have asked the same question for any elliptic curve, not just for x zero n. So this is a question about in general about elliptic curves, which I restated here. Um, let's say you have an elliptic curve over Q. And let's say you have a point in AEQ, which is not the identity point, S, it's called here. And you know that S is an image of the local trace map for every P. Like, what's the, what's the possibility, or is it true always, that S is in the uh, image of the global trace map? 
it's a question about any NFT curve or queue that you can ask. And um, I mean, I I wasn't able to answer this um, during my like grad, grad school. Like it's just like that there's a, only a handful of NFT curves. Or there's only a handful of modular curves that have genus one. So I just um, forgot about them and <laughs> dealt with the higher genus examples. Um, and so this, but this question was bugging me all the time. So when I moved to Texas, um, I mentioned this to Mirla and she was uh, into it. Uh, so I was lucky that we worked together and like, gave an answer to, the, to this question under some assumptions. So the next theorem I'm gonna show you is the exact same low hour theorem. Don't get scared. I'm gonna summarize it um, in the next slide. So um, just the abbreviation is that local global trace principle for true torsion. So it depends that, I mean, it turned out that the study of this question is, has two different flavors, whether or not S is a torsion point or non-torsion point. But of course, if you are asking the question for torsion points, well, the question is trivial for uh, points of odd order. I mean, if your point has order three, let's say, you can just divide your point, and it's a trace of itself, right? S L plus S L plus S. So um, it's only a question for even order points and uh, for free points, for non-torsion points. So this is the answer for um, two torsion points, and the way that I would like to summarize this result is, is as follows. Um, so the local global trace principle holds for the two torsion points of your empty curve, if and only if um, there is a rational point on the twisted empty curve, which is two divisible over Q adjoint root D, non-trivially, meaning that um, if there is a point P, which was not too divisible as a point over Q, but becomes too divisible when you extend your field. So there is, the P half is living in um, EDK, but it wasn't living in EDQ. And here ED literally means the uh, empty curve too. So if, if Y squared is equal to F of X, ED is DY squared is equal to F of X. That's the usual twist. What's the relationship between P and S? Oh, there is like, there's, <laughs> so, um, there is no relation. This, you're asking the question for, if the, the answer, the, this, like, S is here at two torsion point, and I'm saying that if S is a local trace for every P, then it is also a global trace if there is such a P in your empty curve, so. So local great, global trace principle for- not part of the statement, how you get P from Oh, no, 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 you could, there's no relation for getting P from us, yeah. You are just looking for a P that this holds, yes, exactly, yes. <coughs> okay, so just I would like to just mention the idea of the proof very briefly. So this is the map that you're trying to understand, the, the restriction map from the uh, global traces to the local traces. And of course, the kernel of this map measures their obstruction. For instance, if the kernel is trivial, there is no obstruction. Everything which is a local trace is also a global trace. And what's nice about this is that um, this kernel is, is isomorphic to the kernel of the restriction map with Fidotate Shafarovich groups of ED, ED over Q to ED over K. So what we showed was that this kernel intersects the two torsion trivially, um, so there is no local global trace obstruction for two torsion points if we have the non-trivial two divisibility condition um, for our curve. So that's what we um, studied um, to get the proof. Um, and then, of course, we asked the same question for, for non-torsion points, and for non-torsion points, you have to make sure that there is no obstruction for two torsion um, to begin with. So. Um, like this is the summary for this theorem. Check if there is an obstruction for two torsion points. You know how to do it uh, because of the previous theorem. If there is no obstruction for those, then um, you look at um, whether or not there is a, a point which is non-trivial to divisible um, in your in your empty curve. So what I'm trying to get here is that the question about um, Hustler principle violations for genus one curves can be translated to local to global trace obstructions and they have something to do with the two divisibility questions, but um, it's easier um, if you translate the question to the trace obstruction and it's, uh, there's a machine in it you can apply and check things explicitly. So then of course, like nowadays is quite um, um, active, popular 
uh, to study how often this happens, like how often um, do we have uh, an obstruction, local to global trace obstruction. Like we are, this is still work in progress, by the way, uh, but I just want to share it with you, um, the data so far. Um, so we tested uh, for the cures, for the, for it, the cures which has uh, half to torsion, and we tested whether or not this point S um, is a global trace um, under the condition that it's a local trace. And those that, that's like some uh, information about the data. Uh, it's like, we tested for about a million curves. I know it's not too many for some of us in the audience, but it was many for me. <laughs> I haven't done this many calculations before. So um, anyway, so we figured out that like S is a local trace, um, like not very often. Uh, Surprisingly, it was a local trace for only 18% of the time. But among the ones that S is a local trace, it was a global trace half the time. So half the time there is no obstruction, half the time there is an obstruction, according to data. Of course, there are all these distribution questions or <coughs> questions about how um, is this really an asymptotic formula. We don't know yet, but that's still work in progress, as I told you. Okay. Um, are there any questions? I mean, otherwise, I'm going to switch gears a little bit and move on to genus two curves or higher genus curves, let's say. Yes, please. I have a comment. Which uh, so I noticed you left off the real points when you did your local points for x naught n zeta d for the for the twist of x naught n. And there's old work of Ugg and also Achbas and Singerman that was then rediscovered by Andrew Stoney. It uh -huh. can be applied to calculate those real points. And uh -huh. what they do is they pick up the class group in not minus the n, not uh -huh. nq adjoined the square root of minus n, uh -huh. but nq adjoined the square root of n. Uh -huh. So it connects up with Mazur's theorem that as soon as that class group for minus larger than 163 mm -hmm. vanishes, mm -hmm. you, you get no rational points. Yeah. But yeah. here you're running into the problem that uh, you could have class number one a whole lot yeah. at yeah. the positive range. So I was wondering, do you know a counterexample for this, to the rather bizarre uh, conjecture that the rational points can be sort of determined by the class group, like maybe the number of rational points when you twist by a predict particular quadratic extension of Q not for x naught zeta n yeah, just be the class group. Yeah, I know what you know. Not, I, I, not, nothing came out of like that from, from these examples, actually, because um, one thing that they, they most of the time have real points. Well, they, they have real points when, you're, uh, when your class number is uh, not But I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, but the thing is like I, this like I think I know which result you're talking about, but I don't have a counter example of that from these examples. Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll maybe talk. Okay. To you yeah. Later. Okay. All right. Um, okay. So okay. Let's just in the last five minutes, I just want to mention like um, since I like this is again will be more basic than than the the middle part of the talk. Let's say um, how do you approach um, higher genus cases? And I just want to give an example to one of the methods that. You might, want, you might find helpful uh, while studying rational points on um, um, on curves genus bigger than or equal to two. So just to remind you, like um, this was the story. Um, zeta d is our uh, char the um, actually the typo. This is like the, the cycle that's associated to this quadratic number field. So this is our old friend, the twisted modular curve. But if you recall, like the rational points on this twisted modular curve, they lie in the k-rational points of the uh, classical modular curve. So one way uh, is if you can understand the later set, if you can understand x0 and k, then you can maybe under understand the previous one. So for instance, if you can show that there are no k, no k points on x0 n, then you're, you're done. So this is, of course, like um, a harder question, <laughs> but sometimes you get lucky. So one way of like approaching this is like, let's say you have a curve uh, x0 n, which I will denote by c for the rest of the example because it doesn't matter if this is a modular curve or not. Um, it's not hyperelliptic, that's important. And let's say you got lucky and the Jacobian uh, has rec0. Um, and, and this condition can be uh, weakened, but let's, let's stick to this one for now. What you can do is then, since the Jacobian has finitely many rational points, you can enumerate all the points on, the, on it. And then you can think about the um, two-fold symmetric product of your curve, and of course the points on this two-fold product uh, are correspond to the divisors of degree two um, on your curve. And you can consider the following map um, that takes um, d to d minus um, two times one of your cusps. 
since your cusps are rational, like or if you have a rational point on your curve, just pick that point, pick your favorite rational point, and you have a map uh, like that. And since you know that your curve is not hyperelliptic, this map is injective. So what you do is um, you uh, look at all the um, d primes uh, and compute uh, d primes in this Jacobian of Q, uh, Jacobi, uh, and then compute the riemann roch space. Um, see if these are linearly equivalent to an effective degree two divisor, and of course, like those correspond to uh, all the quality points, not just quality points defined on a particular quality field, but they give you all the quality points um, on your um, curve. For instance, if you apply this to X034, which is genus three, now it's a plane, plane quartic, uh, you obtain that X034, the classical modular curve, not the twisted one, has points over QAG over root D if D is minus 1, minus 2, or minus 15. So it's empty otherwise. So there are, it rarely has quadratic points, for instance. Um, but of course, those points, like you can, immediately you can say that my twisted curve is, has no rational point unless D is minus 1, minus 2, or minus 15. But maybe not all of those quadratic points are satisfying the condition that you need, meaning that um, you, you, wanna, you want your quadratic points to be fixed by tau composition Wn, tau being the dollar conjugation. So you look, at, you look for that property, and you see that that property is not satisfied for minus 15. So x0, 34, um, zeta d, q is empty for all d different than minus 1 and, uh, or minus 2. And now you can even like study further, you can uh, compute the, what, or what those points are actually are, and you can compute their like, J invariant, for instance, you can look for the corresponding elliptic curve, and we see that um, those points correspond to elliptic curves, which has complex multiplication, and whenever a curve, a, co a Q curve has complex multiplication, we don't count them, like we see they are exceptional, we don't regard them as helpful as the rest of the Q curves. So like, the conclusion you can say is that there are, like this twist, this particular twist, has no non-exceptional points for any um, QI journal of D, for any quadratic number field. So uh, there is no Q curve of degree 34 um, over any quadratic number field. Deduce from like, this elementary method. I think uh, my time is up. <laughs>